May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I've got a bone to pick with the royal family. <laughs> I was going to start my sermon today by talking about the access that you can get to the king if you're one of his children. Um, and then all over the papers <laughs> this week are the words, Harry's coming to England, but he's not going to see the king because the king doesn't have enough time to see him, doesn't have a space in his schedule. The point I was going to make, which was out of, out of this passage in Hebrews, is that we, we have a way into God's presence. We can come and approach the throne of grace boldly. Well, the only people who can do that with the king are his his close relatives. You know, that if I turned up at Buckingham Palace and said, I'd like to see his majesty, I'd, I was going to say, I'd get a different answer than if Prince William turned up or Prince Harry. But as it turns out, no. <laughs> but the, the thought still stands that uh, sometimes it depends on who you are as to whether you get access to someone important or not. Sometimes it depends on you being related to them. Except here in Hebrews, as, as we will get to the end of the chapter, it talks about us being able to approach that throne boldly in spite of who we are and in spite of what we've done. But here in, in this passage, um, in, in the NIV, uh, there are th four instances of the word therefore now it's a bit of a pun but my new testament tutor in in college always used to say when you see the word therefore in a passage ask yourself what it's there for um, <laughs> and it's a good thought because sometimes words like that we ignore but but what it's doing is depending it the word therefore depends on what's just happened therefore because of that this and last week at, at Desert, I was uh, preaching on, on um, chapter 3 and it was talking about um, the promises that had been given to the people of God and the way that it had been given to, for forgiveness and how they'd, they'd ignored it. And now in chapter 4 it talks about this sense of entering God's rest. And it says, therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of us are to find fallen short of it. The promises of God still stand. The promises of God to his people still stand. Sometimes we can think that perhaps God, like us, might forget his promises, but he doesn't. They stand. And the fact that some people in the desert, which is what we were talking about last week uh, in Hebrews 3, the people in the desert, some people who wandered about the desert because they hadn't they hadn't listened when God had said, you can go into this land and you can take it. And they looked at the land and said, it's very nice, but thank you very much. No, because the people are too strong and too powerful. And so they had to wander around the desert for 40 years until one generation was gone and another generation had grown up. But he says, this, this offer still stands to all of us. And we need to make sure that we don't fall short of it we've had the good news proclaimed to us they had to but they didn't listen they missed out and we'll go on to, to look at that but God talks about the rest that he wants his people to enter in do you ever feel like that do you ever feel like you just want to rest do you ever feel like your life's just too busy just too much going on um, too much happening and it all comes at you at once sometimes it's a bad thing. Sometimes it's a mixture of good and bad. Sometimes even just too much of a good thing can be a bit of an annoying, can't it? Just too much going on. We want to stop. Well, God tells us that there is a rest for the people of God. But the way that he, he, the, the writer to the Hebrew talks about it, it's not so much as being a place as being with a person. I love going home to Ireland. I don't want to live there. I quite like living over here, but I love going home. But it's not quite the same. 
since something that happened 20 years ago. And that's when my mum died. Because going back to Ireland, because my dad had died very early, going back to Ireland was always about seeing mum. It was always about um, getting back um, to the house, or the village rather, because she'd moved houses, to the village where I'd grown up and seeing her. And of course, hearing all the latest things that had happened to all the people that I knew and some of them that I didn't. Um, <laughs> and the chance just to sit. And whatever time I arrived, it was normally in the morning, there would be some food waiting. If it was the morning, it would be um, what they call in Northern Ireland an Ulster fry, um, which had all the things that an English fry has with potato bread, because of course it has to have potato something, doesn't it, if you're going to Ireland. <coughs> but the best bit was seeing her. And I still go home to see my brother and my sister. But it's not quite the same. But the rest that God wants to give his people is the rest of being with him. The one who made the world, the one who made us and made us to be in a relationship with him. His works have been finished since the creation of the world. He looked at the world having made it and made us and said it was good. But then people started disobeying. People started not doing and that's why the people missed out. He says, therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, in verse 6, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again sent a, set a certain day calling it today. And what he's saying there is, look, sometimes we look at the past and we think of the past, the, what the people in the past did and how they wish we wish we could change that. Or maybe particularly how we could change ourselves and what we have done in the past. But the writer says, actually, as far as God looks at things, he wants us to think about today. Today is the day that matters. Because you can't do anything about the past. It, it's gone. You can examine it, you can dig it up, um, you can get someone who's an expert to look at a small piece of pottery about that size and go, oh, that's early Roman. And you think, oh, is it? <laughs> we can examine the past, we can look at it, we can think about it, but we can't change it. And the future is yet to come. God sets a day, calling it today, and says, today, if you hear your voice, don't harden your hearts. Listen to God today. I've met people down through the years who go, I haven't got, got time for God right now. I'll, I'll, I'll give him some time in the future. And for some it's not an excuse. It's real. But the only day we can be sure of is today. God says, don't harden your hearts. How do people harden their hearts? They'd harden their hearts by listening to when God said go and do that and they'd gone no I'm not doing that disobedience Jesus tells a parable um, in one of the gospels about um, a man who had two sons and he says to one of the sons the man says to one of the sons go over there and, and, and sort out that field for me and, and do that work for me and the son says nope not doing that too busy and he says to the other son, son, will you go over there and do that work for me? And he says, yes, dad, I will. But the son who says no changes his mind and goes and does the work his father had asked him to do. And the son who said, oh, of course, dad, I'll do that for you, wanders off in the other direction. And he asks the people, which one was the one who did his father's will? And they say, the one who said no but did it anyway. You see, it's not about the words we speak. It's not about lip service when it comes to God. It's about obeying him. It's about doing what he tells you to do. I've talked before about how um, when my mum asked me to do something quite often forgot it, but there were times when um, she asked me to do something and I kind of ignored it. Um, and I can remember saying at times, why don't you just do what I ask you to do? 
And my normal reaction was, Ooh, I don't know. <laughs> There's no real answer to that, is there? And yet with God, it's like that sometimes. Now, I'm not talking about the times when, it, when we don't know. I'm not talking about the times when it's hard to make our minds up, when, we, when we, we stress over something and we really are wondering, what is the right thing to do in this situation? I'm thinking about the times when we all know what the right thing to do is. The times when someone says something and you think, I really ought to respond to that. When someone shares how tough life is at the moment and we're really busy and there's a lot going on and we know they need to talk and we walk away. When perhaps God puts in our hearts, I really ought to phone so-and-so, I really ought to call round and there's just that, that, that movement in our hearts and, and we don't. When someone says something ridiculous about someone else and we need the courage to say actually no that's not the way it is that's not the truth or when someone asks about God and perhaps we'll go well come and listen to our minister he knows what it's about he'll tell you everything you need to know <laughs> oh got off way with that one <laughs> when actually no it would be better in our faltering stumbling way to speak about the reality of what God has done in our lives through thick and thin. When God calls us to do something and we walk the other way. He says the promise still stands and because of that remember that the day is today. Today is the day when we need to do something about it. Today is the day when we need to respond to him. Today is the day that we need to obey him. And then he says in verse 11, <coughs> Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will perish by following the example of disobedience. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And here's a verse that's often used to talk about this. The Bible. But when the people in the New Testament wanted to talk about the Bible as it was, which would only be the Old Testament, they used the word, the Scriptures. Paul uses that when he talks to Timothy and he says, and from, from your youngest age you have known the Holy Scriptures that are able to teach you. So what's he talking about? What's this writer talking about when he talks about the Word of God? Well, the Word of God, yes, it is what God has given us in the Scriptures, but the Word of God is wider than that. The Word of God, well, quite literally, is Jesus himself. John talks about that. He talks about, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And while it might seem strange to us, particularly if we've been brought up at the church and we've often thought about this, the Word of God, as the actual literal Bible, it it's about God speaking to us, specifically and especially through Jesus, his son. In the, our, our Baptist churches, I know, I know we're a free church, but I'm a Baptist minister. Um, in, in our statement of, of faith, it, it says, Our Lord and Saviour Jesus, Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, is the sole and absolute authority in all matters relating to faith and practice as revealed in the Holy Scriptures. Jesus is the Word of God. The Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to delve into things and separate things and make a separation in things that are not really truly separatable. That's not a word, is it? Able, able to be separated, sorry. Um, God's Word gets in places other things can't get into. And the, the, the point he's making is that God's word penetrates our lives and sees things and shows up things for what they really are. And because of that, we should make every effort to be what God wants us to be. 
I remember once, um, it, was, uh, it was a long time ago, now it must be 30 years ago, I was uh, preaching on a Sunday morning and um, someone, one of the church members came up to me afterwards and said, it's just as well that I know you prepare your sermons well in advance and that you picked this passage weeks ago because it's in the, I used to prepare a, a thing that sort of said what we were preaching on in the future. And I said, really? Yes, she said, because otherwise I think you, I'd think you were going to be getting at me after what I said to you in the week. <laughs> and I said, well, I said, when you said what you said to me in the week, I did think, oops, <laughs> I'm preaching about that very thing on Sunday. Sometimes when God's word is shared, when God's word is preached, not just by preachers and not just by people in the pulpit, but sometimes when people say something, it gets in. It gets in. And perhaps we think, well, how do they know that? Well, they don't. That's the truth. But God does. And God gets, his word gets into our hearts. And often it is the words from the Bible. But God will use his word to get down in there. And to dig out and to pull out those things that perhaps we're not even noticing that are wrong in our lives. Living and active. Penetrating into our very souls. And showing us, first of all, what we're really like. I can't count the number of times when I've said something. Or I've done something. And almost immediately afterwards, someone said something to me. Or I've read something in the scriptures. And thought, oops. So what matters is what do we do at that point? Do we take it on board? Do we listen? Do we hear? Do we think, oh, that's just a coincidence? Or like one of the bishops, I can't remember which one of it was, who said a few years ago, um, I don't know about coincidence, whether are coincidences or not, but it, it does appear to me that the more I pray, the more that coincidences happen. The more we listen to God, the more that we see things in our own lives that need changed and turned around. Therefore, he said, make every effort Make every effort to listen to God's word, to allow God's word to get down in there and to change our lives. And then the final therefore. He says, therefore, since we have such a great high priest as this Jesus, who has gone up to heaven before us, let us approach God's throne with confidence. And that's where he's been getting to the whole chapter. That's where he's been coming to. He says, because of all the things that I've just talked about, let's remember that Jesus, our high priest, has gone into heaven and we can go and approach that throne with confidence. And that's where the royal family ruined my, 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 my thing. Because I was going to say, you know, like, I, I, again, talk about those who can go without asking but the truth is you and I can approach God's throne can approach God's throne of grace with confidence because of Jesus he is the one who lived among us he is the one who was tempted in every way it tells us just as as we are he is the one who understands what it's like to live in this world to lose someone you love Joseph to see his mother cry as he dies on the cross. He is the one to whom we can come with confidence. The one who stands between us and God, the high priest. And that was the high priest's job, to stand between the people and God. To bring the people's requests to God and to speak God's word to the people. And that's what Jesus does. How do you feel when you pray? 
Now, I'm not talking about lack of confidence when you pray out loud, because that's not worry about what God's hearing. That's worry about what other people might think. Um, and I think God's got a terrible sense of humour, because um, he called me into Baptist ministry, which involves not only speaking in front of other people, but praying in front of other people. And I have to tell you, when I was at college, and we had a prayer time every, every night, because we were very holy, not really but uh, we had a prayer time every every evening there were times I could not open my mouth I couldn't open my mouth and it wasn't about God it was about it was about what will they think if I stumble out the stupid thoughts that I have I'm talking about approaching God with confidence and perhaps we feel the same sometimes. Perhaps we think, what's he going to think when I say that? He's going to accept it. He tells us to come with confidence. He's going to hear it. Um, when my children were young, Christopher, you may have heard me speak of him before. He was the one who, who always got blamed because it was always him. Uh, one, one day, um, we got up and the TV we'd bought from Tesco a couple of weeks before it wasn't working anymore so I said to my wife don't worry I'll take it back to Tesco um, I've got the guarantee strangely enough I kept the receipt and um, when I picked up the TV there was water on the table below the television and I thought hmm so I called the children who of course denied all knowledge um, of anything um, so anyway I took it back to Tesco's and thought where I take it back to Tesco. I go back to Tesco. They changed it. That was fine. Um, and later on that day, my middle son Alexander wandered into the room uh, where I was working on the computer and said, um, "Christopher wants to know what would happen to someone if they had tripped and accidentally dropped some water on top of the television." I said, "Oh, does he really?" I said, "Send him in." And <laughs> In he came. And I went, oh, so I hear that someone, someone accidentally tripped and put water over the television. He said, yes. And it was, he did not come with confidence. He had to send someone before him. Now, unfortunately, the story is ruined by the fact that about a year ago, he confessed that, in fact, what he'd done was nothing of the sort. That, in fact, actually, what was on the top of the television was a sort of a fancy candelabra thing. And he wondered if you could put a water balloon on top of that candelabra without bursting the balloon. As he said to all of us when he confessed, he said, turned out you couldn't. <laughs> but when we've done things that are wrong, we don't go with confidence, do we? But God says, come with confidence. Come with confidence and come with boldness. To his throne not because we think we're great but because we know he is not because we think we're wonderful but because we know he is gracious come with confidence let's say to you today come with confidence to him and find in him all you need to enter that rest and to live in his presence Father, help us, we pray. Help us to know you. Help us to love you. Help us to serve you. And to come with confidence to you. Amen.